Our last topic today, this is a panel discussion. Brett McDowell is going to moderate it. Um, Grant's going to sit in the panel as well. I'm going to call R Rajiv Delakia and Kevin Lynch up. So Rajiv's from Knock Knock Labs, Kevin from Synaptics. Uh, the topic is FIDO and IoT. Uh, very interesting, buzzy space. Uh, this group's going to talk to you about um, how FIDO authentication uh, may apply to the Internet of Things. Thank you, Andrew. So this is how we're closing out today, kind of looking ahead. Um, of course, uh, IoT is here today, but FIDO's role in the Internet of Things is uh, something that we are currently focused on and charting. So this is kind of looking to the future. Um, oh, I see. Um, so very quickly, because we don't have a lot of time with you and I want to be able to do q and I'm going to move right into this and I'm going to ask each panelist to come up to the podium and give their opening remarks and kind of help us position this discussion. Why are we even talking about FIDO and IoT? So just my, my quick version of that, um, FIDO authentication is designed to solve the password problem, as we've heard throughout the day. So that's a user needing to wield a credential to authenticate to an online application. That's the core use case. So of course in IoT, there's a lot of user-facing authentication use cases. But there are also other use cases. And there's a special role between the user, the cloud, and the IoT device, and device to device. So that's just a quick teaser. That's why we have to look at what have we done with the FIDO authentication protocols that can be reused to solve some of the authentication challenges in IoT, especially given that IoT and standards are so fragmented right now. So with that, I'm going to start by inviting up Kevin, who's introduced yourself, and, and answer the question, so what is the history? How, where, how did we get here with FIDO, uh, as FIDO Alliance looking at IoT? Thank you, Brett, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kevin Lynch. I'm with the Strategic Marketing Group inside the Biometric Products Division at Synaptics. So we make uh, fingerprint sensors, and we've deployed a lot of these fingerprint sensors to smartphones in, uh, in, in, in products that are uh, shipping around the world right now. Um, historically, FIDO has enabled the use of these credentials, and, and from my perspective, I'm very fingerprint-centric. Uh, so we're very um, concerned with staying close to the user. We are the uh, identification mechanism that uh, connects. We, we, we're on the edge. We're, we're, we're touching the user and we're connecting them with the, in, into the rest of the system. As we move into an IoT scenario, the actors are changing a little bit. Instead of having a, a client that's going up to the cloud um, and a very high uh, capacity server that's up there that's got the identity management requirements, we are now in an IoT uh, in environment where the cloud uh, maybe, may excuse me, maybe um, uh, in, in your home, managing your home automation um, system. The cloud uh, may be in your car, uh, managing uh, uh, various components of identity that are important for your car and, and, and for transportation needs. So FIDO has built this very good, in my opinion, very good foundation for managing local identity for not having to distribute um, uh, biometric credentials directly uh, to the servers. Um, but it, it's been dealing with this big gap, the cloud to the client. Um, as these change and as the functions that are normally happening up in the, in the big cloud now happen in these smaller clouds that are beginning to surround us, we have to migrate the, uh, the technology that, that we've used in order to, um, uh, to, take care, to take care of these new use cases. So building on the foundation that, that FIDO has built, how do we now move into the next environment? Um, we've seen a lot of work um, moving from the FIDO UAF and U2F specifications that are just getting deployed right now to the ability for platforms now to be authenticators with the, the specifications under FIDO2. What's going to happen next? And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer and quite confident that addressing this IoT problem and allowing user credentials, the delegation of, 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 of those into our IoT devices so that our refrigerators can 
con confidently make a, uh, a purchase request uh, uh, to, uh, to, to Whole Foods now. Um, or our car can make a, uh, can make a payment of a, of a toll on our behalf. So um, delegation and, and, and delegation of consent to, uh, to, to, to act uh, within our uh, sphere of, of devices that are in IoT. That's what I think is on the horizon. I think that that's what's important. Thank you, Kevin, for helping to tee, tee this up and why we now have an official study group spun up to look at FIDO and IoT and FIDO Alliance, We're making progress on this. Next, I want to invite Rajiv up, uh, introduce himself, his company, why this question is important uh, to him and his stakeholders, and to answer the question for us, um, what are the capabilities of FIDO that are most promising to apply into IoT and maybe highlight some of the capabilities that are out there that um, you might not know that much about because they're not featured necessarily in the FIDO 101. Rajiv. Thank you, Brett. Um, so I'm Rajiv Dalakia. I run products business development at a company called Knock Knock Labs. We're probably best known for being one of the original founders of the FIDO Alliance, and we deliver products that run all of the different protocols uh, that the FIDO Alliance works on. Uh, we are co-authors on uh, both the FIDO 2 and the UAF specification. So um, how did we come about this whole uh, business of FIDO and, and, um, and IoT? Well, IoT is a, a damn big space, and sometimes you approach it through a specific vertical, whether it's connected home, connected health, connected car, connected factory, um, connected city. And as you dig a little bit deeper, what you notice is that in each of those use cases, um, there are users present. Sometimes they're present as administrators or people that provide service into those uh, networks. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, they're direct consumers that interact with those devices either actively or maybe in the future a little bit more passively. Um, so if you, if you break that down a little bit further, what you, what you notice is basically four primary use cases where um, a user uh, may be talking to a cloud that configures the device. Um, the user may be talking directly to a device. Uh, the device may be talking independently to a cloud. Um, or the device may be having an interaction directly with another device. And, and again, if you, if you dive a little bit deeper into, into that, those, those scenarios, what you notice is that all of this stuff starts to map very cleanly onto some of the, the foundations uh, of what we designed FIDO around. So just to mention some of those security problems, uh, obviously, FIDO was, was, uh, was initially conceived to eliminate the password problem. If anybody hasn't heard about the DIN attacks to, to uh, where passwords were embedded in IP cameras uh, and then hacked to bring down uh, half the internet uh, in this country, that should give you a, a, a pretty good idea. Um, there are other interesting problems, which is how do you distinguish that you're really talking to a genuine device? and not a virtual machine at the other end of the spectrum. And FIDO's got some interesting work that we've done in this area in a subject area called attestation. Um, you typically also want to characterize what the security posture boundaries are um, of the authenticator itself. How is that authentication implemented on that device? And turns out FIDO's done some excellent work in that area as well. Um, and a lot of people know FIDO for the for the, from the pluggability aspect of different authenticators, but, but the other part of FIDO that's equally important is how it binds the request and response so that you can eliminate man-in-the-middle phishing, uh, other kinds of interesting uh, uh, scalable automated attacks that can arise. Uh, for those of you who are old enough, you, you, you might remember that, that probably back in, in the mid-90s, Intel um, decided in their wisdom to put a, a key uh, um, of some kind that identified their CPU boards. This was a group out of Arizona. Turned out to be a bit of a privacy disaster. And, and as we think about how we want to secure the Internet of Things, the last thing that you want is, is some kind of a, a global correlation handle that's sitting on each of those devices. And turns out, again, FIDO's been very careful in its designs to, to build in privacy at, at, at the very bottom of the, of the stack. Um, so, so Brett referred to, to some, some capabilities that we had originally envisioned uh, and designed into some of the foundations of how we think about FIDO. For UAF, for the UF specification, for example, talks about this notion of a silent 
authenticator. It is a privacy-preserving authenticator still in the sense that, it, that there is some consent process during the provisioning of the key, but thereafter, there is no user present. And we had envisioned it originally to, to service use cases such as things like point-of-sale terminals or, or devices where you cared really about the device, not so much about the active user. Um, Brett also mentioned that, that we've, uh, we've started some, some birds of feather uh, discussions that have been both very well attended and a very diverse set of use cases across some of the sectors that I talked about, connected home, connected health, et cetera, starting to percolate a little bit. Uh, as Knock Knock Labs, we've done some, uh, some work commercially in this area with a company called Gallagher. Uh, they are one of the, the uh, biggest manufacturers of physical door locks and access control systems. And, and figuring out how to take the existing protocols and map them onto things like embedded systems and distribute them in, in very large networks uh, at scale. And, uh, and, and you know, it turns out that these use cases uh, whether you, you think about the connected car scenario where you walk up to a car rental company and as a user authenticate to that uh, car rental company uh, and rent a car, and then you have to walk up to that car, perhaps in the depths of a garage without connectivity for the car or for yourself, and have to prove who you are to get possession of that car. Uh, and that, uh, for that car at some point when it is connected to be able to reconcile uh, the usage characteristics with the, with the cloud. So all of these, these use cases in the end turns out are super well adapted to many of the core protocols uh, and, and technologies that we have designed and are, are deploying at FIDO. We welcome you to come in and join us because this is a very active area of interest. When we did the FIDO IoT seminar, that was probably you know, three times or four times the usual attendance that we get at the, at the FIDO seminar. So, um, hopefully that have convinced you that there's some merit in looking into the usage of FIDO protocols for this purpose. I'm be happy to take questions on the panel. Thank you, Rajiv. So Rajiv uh, brought us a little further um, in, in framing how FIDO might fit in IoT and some of the capabilities that FIDO already has support for. Um, but the next, I want to ask Grant to come up and talk about, you know, kind of some boundaries we've set for ourselves. What's really in scope and out of scope for this exploration about FIDO authentication in IoT? How are we going to play with other industry initiatives, both you know, platform-oriented protocols and other open standards in this area? Um, so Grant, if you can come on up and shed some light on that for us. Yeah, um, so I guess what I want to say is, uh, you know, the word IoT, I've never really been a huge fan of it. I mean, I obviously can't push back against the entire world. Um, I think it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, I think it's a sort of a new word for an old idea, right? We've had industrial control systems for a long time. We had home automation for a while. But I think it's finally sort of reached a scale uh, where, it, where, it, where it sort of got a new word, which is IoT. And I think that um, a lot of different things in this space, you know, have a lot of different associations and consortiums and standards that sort of operate independently of each other. I'll be the first to admit I'm not an expert in the IoT space, so I'll talk just briefly about a couple of things that I am familiar with. So I know that there are, you know, sort of domain-specific initiatives, whether it's the Connected Car Consortium or, you know, some of the stuff in the industrial control space to um, define, you know, standards for interoperability within a particular domain. Um, but then there's also uh, the sort of uh, the consumer space, which is yet another domain. But I think it's the one that, at least for me, when people say IoT, is the one that first jumps to mind. You know, the Alexas and the Google Homes and the light bulbs and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and I think a lot of those. Um, and some of the more enterprise industrial stuff, you know, are increasingly getting built on the sort of public cloud platforms, right? So both Amazon and Google um, and other cloud vendors have um, IoT sort of design patterns that they're advocating for sort of providing a platform for uh, these devices to leverage um, cloud services. And I think that, the, for me at least, the interesting thing is that IoT sort of pushes you more towards um, a heavy server light client model in some ways, but also because of network connectivity problems pushes you in the other direction towards a sort of autonomous roving node of devices that all talk to each other. Um, and I think there's sort of two 
the, well, there's a bunch of problems that you need to sort out, right? You need a place to store data, you need a way to, for these devices to communicate both locally and to the cloud, all of these different protocols. But sort of at the foundation of all of that is authentication, right? And FIDO is concerned with authentication, and so I think we've said that, you know, we're, our intentions with the, any FIDO IoT initiatives is not to create yet another competing IoT standard, but rather to try and say, you know, hey, can we provide a standardized mechanism for authentication that, that leverages some of the ideas that we already have? And I think that, um, you know, what are, what are those ideas? Well, as Rajiv said, there's sort of two relevant pieces, I think, in IoT authentication. One is sort of end user authentication, right? The user needs to manage and interact with their device and authenticate to their device. Maybe that's a local channel, right, between you and your connected phone or you and your connected uh, camera, or maybe it routes through the cloud. Um, but I think also the device to device channel is just as important. Right, these devices need to authenticate to each other or authenticate to the cloud. And I think that um, the mechanism that, that most of these sort of IoT air standards and stuff are using for that is some form of, of public key cryptography. Now there's a lot of details in the differences in the details. Do they use PKI or do they use raw public keys? What you know, particular way do they design the protocol? Um, uh, do they leverage, you know, sort of technology uh, from the 90s in the sort of PKI space and X509 certificates and these kinds of things, or are they, they, are they using a sort of approach more like the FIDO approach, which, which is uh, a, little bit, a little bit different um, to try and address some of the challenges with that problem. And so I think that um, on that device-to-device -device space, you know, the sort of basic idea is almost always the same. Uh, but the details differ, and I think that's an important space for, for standards to try and step in and clarify, like, what exact format and protocol should you use, what exactly, how exactly should you communicate the crypto protocols and that kind of stuff. And so from my, from my point of view, I, I sort of think that, you know, the FIDO air efforts in this space are, are, are sort of targeting that narrow sort of authentication problem, which in some sense is not very different from the sort of human to device or human to cloud problems that FIDO is more traditionally associated with. Thank you, Grant. All right, so now uh, the panelists will use their handheld microphone uh, to quickly answer any questions that you have. Um, I, I can also come up with questions, but we really want to give you the value getting your questions answered right here. Great, let me just recap that for those who couldn't hear you. So since IoT is a market where costs, very cost sensitive market for the device manufacturers themselves, and presuming there's some added cost to that device manufacturer to FIDO enable their devices, what's the business case for that OEM to add FIDO? Kevin? Well, practically speaking, the, the cost for, for biometrics, for example, has been driven by the, the, the pressures that the smartphone guys have, have put on suppliers like us. So I think that the rest of the industry, the embedded industry, is going to be able to take advantage of, of all the efforts that we've gone into is to get cost out uh, of those specific devices. Um, the other issue comes down to the use case. Um, if we're making a, um, a, a payment of a few dollars to cross a bridge, we've got a fair amount of tolerance uh, in that uh, for, um, uh, for accepting some risk. Um, the actual danger on that is an uh, is a indiv individual user um, not paying their toll uh, properly. If we move to another use case, for example, medical devices, the tolerance for, for, for error in that can get extremely, uh, extremely low. In that circumstance, we're talking about um, uh, having someone identify themselves that can control my insulin pump or my pacemaker. So in those cases, making a higher investment um, that's going to be more appropriate for the security that's required for that application makes perfect sense. But I think there's going to be a spectrum of very low cost uh, um, uh, solutions to address low risk uh, situations um, and, very, and, and, and higher cost ones to, to address the, the situations where, where we absolutely have to guarantee um, that, that, the, that there's no fraud involved at all. 
Um, a, qu a quick comment to, to say that we don't necessarily see um, FIDO in, in, in every device, so to speak. Right, so you, you may end up with different security architectures where um, you know, there's some kind of a manufacturer-specific um, uh, communication capability. Um, you know, take, take whether it's Apple or Google or any of these guys or, or Microsoft. I think in the, in the end, it's very early days for, for some of those kinds of, of um, ecosystems. And, and today, I think they tend to be designed very tightly as end-to-end -end systems. Um, I think there are some very interesting use cases where FIDO will come to play. And I, as, as Kevin said, um, we are pretty comfortable that from a technology perspective, the technology, both from an economics perspective and a bits and bytes perspective, can scale both server and client elements down into very, very constrained environments. Um, there, are, there are some challenges. Uh, you know, if you're talking about a passive sensor sitting on a bridge, it's, it's unlikely to acquire any kind of, of uh, FIDO capability anytime soon. Um, but I think in, in many of those other cases, um, you know, you'd be surprised at what you can adapt uh, some of the, the technology stack to the last. I'll, I'll, I'll say I think that there is some, uh, you know, what, what's the forcing function where there isn't one, right? I, I think short of, short of regulation or reputation, um, I, I think ultimately these are the two drivers uh, for manufacturers to, or, or direct economic risk of a lawsuit of some kind. And I think that all of those three elements are still in their early stages right now from a forcing function perspective. Uh, yeah, the other thing I'll say is that, um, at least on the device to device, like, I, look, I think that on the human to device side, I think you're exactly right, right? Like, uh, the admin panel on my, you know, camera that lets the person hack in and upload new firmware and then launch, use it as a distributed DDoS attack. Like, I think that's a tough lift, right? It's going to have to be these reputational and regulatory things. Um, I think on the device to device side, though, a lot of the protocols that already exist already leverage some kind of, you know, asymmetric crypto. And I think that's in part, at least, because a lot of the chips out there already offer those capabilities built in, in some form or another. And so I think that um, in that space, right, it's not so different from how FIDO works today. And so I think that e there's some incentives to standardize that in order to make the, the interoperability work across all the different relying parties, the different public cloud vendors, the different, you know, APIs that these devices might want to interact with. Um, yeah, you know, I'm going to take one, a shot. One quick, um, one quick additional comment there. I think Arm is a is a member of the FIDO Alliance, and I think they've um, they've talked been talking, I think, for the better part of a year plus now about their low end Arm chip um, that actually now incorporates some trust execution environment capabilities in it. If you haven't looked at it, do because it's very interesting. Both, it's an interesting capability to to bring in in that low end chip down. Um, whether that ends up being the, the, the one of choice for some of these IoT devices or not, I don't know. But, but to me, it's a, it's a super interesting signal that someone took the pain and the, end, the time to engineer those capabilities down in some of these very, very low-end chipsets um, that may be used in IoT devices. Thanks, Rajiv. So I'm going to take a shot at answering that question, too. So I'm just speculating. But um, there's a couple of trends that you could see addressing the, the financial case for OEMs. One would be, look who's already building in FIDO capability at the component level. So ARM is a great example, uh, Qualcomm is another. You know, when you have the components already getting FIDO capabilities, that makes it easier and much more affordable than you'd think for the OEM to add FIDO. So at some point, with the kind of platform adoption, Right, so you have Google and Microsoft very involved in FIDO, bringing this to the platform. Now, one of the biggest problems you have that would drive the market, you know, is the ease of use. So we don't have the same ease of use argument we have when we say, like, let's move from passwords to FIDO authenticators. But you have another ease of use challenge with IoT of getting the device on your network. How do I provision this device on my network? How do I get it to play nice with the other devices? And if the platforms, if the ecosystem you're trying to sell into is already using FIDO for itself because no one wants um, their, their network of devices to be used as a fraud vector, I actually think there are free market private sector incentives to build these devices even at the low end cost points 
with FIDO and having all the chip manufacturers that are popular in IoT participating in the FIDO alliance is a good sign that that price point's gonna drop pretty fast. Another, another question? Time for one more question. Hopefully it's a yes or no answer. So I'll <laughs> ask a quick question. Um, so I just wanna point this out. Uh, anyone can chime in to back me up here. So when you think of FIDO, you think of a, a client server protocol. Inherently it's client server protocol. So in IoT, you're looking at a lot of mutual authentication happening device to device. So I'm gonna throw that question out to the panel. Would someone like to speak to you? What would you expect an IoT device to have to implement it? Is it the client, is it the server? Does it have to do both? Is there gonna be a third kind of actor in the architecture? Anyone wanna take a shot at speculating that? Well, the, the fact that we're gonna have FIDO authenticators in our smartphones uh, allows us to take a lot of that functionality and, and already have it available uh, with a high capacity uh, processing and connectivity to the cloud. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, th I think that that's one, that's one component. Um, it's already gonna be available. It's gonna be available in some form. Um, what's necessary is gonna be able to accommodate that in, in the, as I like to call it, the smaller IoT cloud that might be, uh, that might be uh, revolving around my particular application. Yeah, so, speaking as an implementer that's, that's gone around implementing some of this stuff, what I can say is, um, you know, don't think when you, when you hear the word server, um, you know, some kind of a rack-mounted appliance. Uh, you know, what, what the, the server side of FIDO consists of some, some fairly interesting and elemental operations. There's registration, there's, uh, there's authentication. There's the ability to segment those and distribute those into a network. So it turns out that that you can you can put these components in in what I'd call you know microserver kind of format if you so desire in in extremely constrained environments. So I think this this business of of us being a client server protocol need not be about rack mounted devices. Uh, the protocol itself very adaptable. Uh, it can be segmented, distributed, and and deployed in interesting ways. And we've had the pleasure of, of working with some of the, uh, some, some folks that work in very constrained spaces and, and helping them achieve uh, those particular goals. Yeah, I would just add, um, I think at least in the consumer IoT space, my bet, well, and I might be wrong, my bet is that connectivity is only gonna get better and that most of the value use cases that are motivating these things require cloud connectivity and the sort of predominant problem on the consumer IoT side is the connection from a low power IoT device to the public cloud or to some kind of a local router which then is connecting to the public cloud. And in those models, the devices have to implement the, the sort of authenticator side of the protocol which we already know it can be implemented in low power, low cost devices like the, uh, you know, the the YubiKeys and, and, and in the future, even much lower cost devices. Um. Okay. Um, you know, maybe, maybe worth mentioning some of the unexpected benefits that, that spill over. So we did some work with um, uh, EMV Co. And, and one of the interesting use cases that we talked about, I think, publicly last year in October was this, uh, this thing called UVC or U user verification um, uh, action. So, so you know, the use case is simply that, that you, you authenticate it into the cloud to your bank and at some point you're walking up to a, to a checkout counter and you want to use your Visa card from that bank to, or, or MasterCard to, to transact. Um, and, uh, and should you be forced to go through the verification process, again, wouldn't it be nice if the folks who were handling that transaction had some kind of a indication um, that within some window of time you had, you had done your last authentication event. So for example, uh, in, in that particular case, we ended up developing this, this concept called UVC. Um, it's being built into or, or proposed as a part of the next set scope of standards, both for UAF and for FIDO2. Um, and it turns out that uh, some of those same kinds of capabilities are super useful uh, in a device to, in a, in a user to device in a, when both are, are, are not, not well connected. Uh, scenario. Thank you. So a couple of things I'd like to leave you with, and I'll turn it over to Andrew to wrap up our day together. Um, FIDO and IoT. So the, the FIDO authenticator is basically just think of it as some functions. Does my IoT device need to create keys? 
and then sign challenges, set of functions. Does my IoT device need to register uh, public keys or key handles and verify challenges? Does it need to do both? Just think of them as subsets of functionality and not cloud device. Because I think you're going to see these capabilities come out in a lot of uh, you know, mesh architectures. Also, that FIDO authentication today is used offline. It will continue to be used offline. And that that's a, a perfectly good mode that's been designed to support. So I think we're going to see a lot more about FIDO in IoT. And we are already partners with Connected Car Consortium about bringing uh, FIDO authentication into the smart car. Uh, and I invite any of you, if you are active in an IoT standards effort or industry association, we'd love to work with you uh, to make sure that we can avoid the fragmentation, at least for the authentication piece that every IoT protocol needs to handle. And thank you for your time. Please help me uh, thank the panelists. OK, so thanks, everybody. That brings us towards the end of our day. Uh, just to um, wrap things up here, um, you know, I think you had a, you heard it from a variety of perspectives today on FIDO. And you've seen me try to fiddle with I, uh, Mac OS unsuccessfully. Um, a couple of key takeaways. Um, you know, now that you've uh, heard about you know, FIDO's vision, uh, FIDO's technology, you've heard from some companies that have deployed FIDO and some use cases, you've heard a bit about our futures. Um, if you wish to get involved with FIDO, or there's, there's ways to tap into the FIDO ecosystem, um, you can uh, use uh, FIDO security keys today, as you learn about, uh, with your Google services, Facebook services, uh, Dropbox, you know, a, a number of sites. Um, if you want to get involved with FIDO, uh, we have a number of community resources. We have newsletters. We have a events, active events activity um, that you can tap into as well. Uh, another key call to action here is to either build FIDO certified or roll out FIDO certified. So if you're a vendor who's looking to build FIDO products, take the time to become FIDO certified. Uh, one thing we're seeing in the marketplace is more and more organizations are specifying uh, FIDO in their RFPs. So there's value in becoming FIDO certified. Conversely, if you're a vendor who's rolling out authentication solutions, look for FIDO certified products and services from the FIDO community. Um, if you wish to get involved in FIDO as a member, come see Brett or I afterwards. We'd be happy to talk to you about that. Otherwise, uh, please uh, follow us on Twitter, visit the website, and thanks again for taking time today. Thank you.